Have theme will travel. This is Solo Travel Talk. Your solo travel advisor is Astrid Clements. If you have a special interest, a hobby, a pilgrimage, even theme travel might be a good option for you. Astrid Clements will talk today about this specialized type of travel and what it holds for the solo traveler. For the uninitiated, Astrid, what are theme trips? Well, these are uh, trips that focus on a particular topic, subject, or activity rather than just, you know, broad overview or sightseeing or whatever, uh, traveling to a particular destination. And I'll kind of give you just a broad example. Basically, you could take a, uh, say, a basic tour of Holland versus uh, learning about Dutch landscape while barging in Holland during tulip season. And there is a particular trip, and they they describe it as this way. But that's, that's kind of the different mindset of a theme-based uh, trip. Basically, you can either... Ev- either sightsee all over Holland, or you could barge all through Holland during the tulip season and really get a feel for what the culture is like in terms of how it's linked to tulips. And I mean, tulips have so much meaning. I mean, I even when I went to Istanbul, uh, got a whole new education about tulips and the symbolism, etc. Oh, yeah, very interesting, Hmm. very interesting. So that's kind of the difference between a theme-based trip and just a regular trip. But basically, your theme-based traveler seeks to delve deeper into a particular interest while traveling rather than just touring or hanging out on the beach or partying or just relaxing. They're travelers that take these theme-based trips that they really want to get what I call a deeper, more authentic connection to the place where they're traveling and and to really understand its culture. So when they come back home, it will it will have more vivid memories. They'll be able to incorporate some of the things that they really enjoyed about the culture into, say, their daily lives. You just absorb everything that uh, you're experiencing more if you have some kind of focus, especially a focus that you particularly are interested in. You already got me going because I was thinking a tulip. I would never have guessed a tulip tour. I would never have thought of that. Oh, yeah. In fact, tulip tours, river cruises, basic tours, even bike uh, bicycling tours during this season are very popular yeah. in Holland. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot, too. Uh, the whole tulip phenomenon. Yeah, who knew? Well, okay. So I mean, there was a whole tulip financial crash. Yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Long time ago. laughs> But so you okay? So that's a great example to get us started. But can you give us a list, maybe, of some other theme trips to get our imaginations really going here? Okay. Well, let's let's think in terms of two broad categories. First of all, you've got your enrichment trips. Okay, and these are kind of what I call your cultural immersion trips. Either they're focused on the visual arts or, say, uh, the performing arts, food and wine. Uh, There are also a lot of great literary tours now that, you know, unless you are interested in literature and, um, you know, how it played in different uh, uh, epics of mankind, etc. But there, this is a this is actually an evolving type of tour. Also, you have history tours, uh, then theme cruises, cruise ships. Now, whether they're riverboat or uh, big luxury liners, they are actually having certain cruises that are theme based. Whether they're music, say jazz, big band, or say even a cooking. Uh, a cruise where they have a celebrity chef or two that, you know, teaches cooking courses and gives classes. And, oh, uh, you know, so it, it's really, it's not just um, kind of like an offbeat type of tour. It's something that people are looking for. Then you've got like your activity focused tours. Now, those have been around longer, I'd say, than some of these more specific uh, kind of cultural enrichment tours. But 
hiking tours, like hiking through uh, uh, Austria or kayaking, biking. Oh, biking tours are great now through England, uh, Tuscany, oh, wow. Italy. Oh, yeah. And then, they, you know, they go to all the little villages and they stop to eat and they do specific things that are key in the village. Say there's a great cheese maker there. They go to the cheese making factory. I mean, there are all kinds of tours now that uh, are being conceived that are really cool around these activities. Then uh, you have uh, photography uh, theme-based tours. These are great. And I guess these would kind of be enrichment and activity uh, because they're they're doing both. But uh, if you like to take photographs and you really want to be a good photographer, uh, maybe not a professional one, but you can take some of these great classes now that, you know, you not only tour a place, but you're touring a place with the focus of photography. And uh, a golf, you know, these types of uh, tours have been around. So so these are the two different types of uh, categories and the types of trips that you'll find uh, in these categories. Now, I'm going to get a little bit more specific to kind of whet your appetite to show you exactly you know the richness of what's out there history buffs this is a very popular tour for veterans and for people who like uh, wartime history etc but the d-day battle normandy tours in northern france they are consistently packed all the time and uh, i've talked to many people who've gone uh, who have really come back even more patriotic and um, thankful for all of our blessings in the United States and what uh, our um, armed forces have done to protect that. So that's a very popular history tour. Then back to the photography. National Geographic has fabulous tours. I mean, when it comes to photography, National Geographic has the best photographers in the world, and they focused on photography from the beginning of their uh, existence. So their particular photography uh, tours are great. There's a super one to Morocco, and Morocco is just a fabulous, um, what I call, subject matter for uh, photography. It's colorful. It's just so many different uh, things that that can, you know, grab your eye and your attention. Uh, Also, some great safari photography classes and, and, and tours. I mean, National Geographic, if you want to take a photography tour, I highly recommend you do that. Okay, then for uh, the foodies out there and for people who want to learn more about cooking and cuisine, uh, the New York Times travel, they have a lot of good trips uh, when, it call, when it comes to enrichment trips. So uh, if you're looking for these types of trips, go on their website. But they have a trip called Cooking with the Sicilians. And this is a nine-day trip that is uh, given or guided by a tour, uh, excuse me, a food uh, critic. And uh, you learn about the history of the Sicilian cuisine. You meet artisans, you meet chefs, you go to olive farms and meet the farmers, learn all about olive farming and the different types of olives, cheese makers. You know, you just really get totally uh, immersed in Sicilian cooking as well as taking the you'll have some classes. So it is just a smorgasbord focused on food and cooking, but also you're getting a lot of the history of Sicily and seeing the beautiful architecture Mm -hmm. and just the basic landscape of Sicily. I know I spent a week in Sicily, oh, about 20 years ago, I actually did my master's thesis on uh, the Mezzogiorno, and Sicily is part of what's called the Mezzogiorno, and it's the southern half of Italy. And actually how uh, the southern half of Italy's culture is so different from the north, that's kind of what my uh, thesis was about. But I won't go into that right now. But (laughs) the bottom line is Sicily is beautiful. And Sicily is a place that, unless you specifically want to go there, either maybe you're 
uh, former relatives uh, originated from there, whatever. Most people really don't go, end up going to Sicily. They'll go to the Malfi Coast and and uh, Capri and and Naples and Pompeii, but they never take that ferry across to Sicily. And Sicily is mysterious, and it's very beautiful, and it's very rich. So I think this particular uh, a tour would be super, especially for foodies. Then, music lovers, people who are into opera. There are many great opera um specialty tours. One particular one is opera in San Francisco, and San Francisco has really some of the most high-quality opera in the world, but uh, there's an excellent five-day tour. It's focused on food, and it, well, likewise in San Francisco, fabulous food. You have lectures uh, about uh, opera, as well as you go to four different performances at night and, of course, tours some of the beautiful architecture and, you know, the Bay Area, etc. So for somebody who loves opera, who wants to go to a very unique and special place, opera in San Francisco uh, sounds like a great theme-based trip. Another one, which I think is very uh, unusual, but um, for people who like the decorative arts, like interior design, mm. etc., there is a trip uh, called Discovering the Fine Art of Porcelain. And this particular trip will take you to Berlin, Dresden, and Munich. And these are the areas where there was just fabulous porcelain made in the Baroque era and and later. I mean, they really refined uh, porcelain making to an art form and to a collectible form. But you'll go to the Meisen factory, the KPM Royal Factory, and, and you'll just learn everything about porcelain as well as enjoy Berlin and Munich and Dresden with this filter. And this is a really great filter to uh, learn about the history, a whole different snapshot of what you see in Germany, because so much of what is focused in Germany is World War II, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, the the darker Nazi period, etc. But this is showing you a side of uh, how refined and how special a lot of the German culture uh, has been through the ages through porcelain. So I thought I thought that's a very, uh, uh, very interesting one. I love the word that you just used, the filter. And I just thought, oh, that's so such a great way to think of this is that your theme tour is like a special lens through which you can see the place you're visiting. It's really, that's such a nice sort of concept. Right, because, you know, it takes you out of just like sightseeing or, you know, just going to a museum and putting on the headset and li- listening to it, which is, it's not bad. I mean, if that's just all the time that you have, it's better to do that than nothing. But if you could, say, go to Venice on an art enrichment tour where you've got a professor from the university uh, explaining to you before you go to each museum and you go into the different uh, periods in the artists themselves before you even go into the museum. And then, you know, as you're going through the museum, you know, certain other things will be brought out. And then when you go and you have dinner at night and you're eating some of the things, and you'll be surprised how the conversations will uh, kind of evolve into what you saw that day and how you're eating and the way of life there. And, and you will be slowly getting the consciousness of what is in that place. So it's, you know, I really love this kind of travel. Mm. Uh, a couple more examples, because I really want, I really want the listeners to kind of um, get, I don't want to say get the bug, but <laughs> but really think about this and, and, and take some of these tours, because it makes the trip expense in the whole uh, trip much more, uh, enriching and memorable. I think it's a, a good way to travel. 
if you're ready for that, okay? Uh, there's another cool or kind of unique trip. I wouldn't call it cool, but it's um, it's got a, a pretty strong flavor to it. It's called Christmas in Victorian England. And this particular tour is a combination of, well, it's focused on Charles Dickens uh England and you go to all the places where he wrote about and you know you learn about his uh, literary style and and everything about Charles Dickens and Charles Dickens England Victorian England but then you also uh, are immersed in the English traditions uh, Christmas traditions that were done in his time that are still uh, practice today as well as the new uh, Christmas traditions uh, in England. So I thought that I know a lot of people like to go to the Christmas market tours or they like to go to Europe during Christmas because, you know, in some of the uh, cities and the villages, they really still do practice some of the tradition so I thought that that was kind of a cool one and then two uh, say for uh, your activity type of theme-based tours one is called walking across England now I have always wanted to do this this particular tour I think it's 10 days where you walk across England I think at the most narrow part of it but you stop in little uh, villages in this specific path. And this is kind of like a, a rite of passage for a lot of hikers, for people who uh, are really into walking and the benefits of walking, not just for exercise, but for self-discovery, for a lot of uh, different reasons that people who are not into walking you know, really go for it. Oh, absolutely. So I've always wanted to do it. But now at my age, I don't know. (laughs) Oh, don't say that. (laughs) I might do it. But they do have, uh, you know, pick up vans uh, along the way, uh, if you if you can't make it from one stop to another. But still, uh, that's I think that would be a really, really great trip. And then there are biking tours all through Tuscany. I I mean, and I know some people who have taken them, and they just love them because typically they're focused on food, wine, and biking. So (laughs) you're eating, drinking, working on the (laughs) couch. Couch. But then you're stopping at all of these uh, nice small towns and villages, which all of them have, you know, it's it's like uh, a throwback in time where life is slower, life is uh, nicer, life is um, it's it's quite charming and quite engaging. I mean, you think, oh, this would be so nice to just be here you know they they drink espresso uh, uh, in the late afternoon and just talk and check in with each other and just there are a lot of things that go on uh, in these smaller towns that hasn't changed uh, over the centuries so it's nice to kind of um, experience that and then you know you're on a biking tour like I said so um uh, those are some of my examples, so I hope I've wet wet your appetite and made you start thinking. Uh, but you know, a lot of these theme based trips are evolving and new ones, et cetera, because there's so many more people that have the time and that want to do these kinds of trips. And I kind of like them to adult camp. You know what I'm saying? Or like a, a like a luxury uh, field trip. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, especially the baby boomers, you know, a lot of us, we went to camp or we did a lot of, you know, enriching things over the summer. And now that, you know, we're retired and we don't have to work anymore, we can do our hobbies or some of our special interests. So these types of trips are, you know, really growing in popularity. And that's really, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I think that's happening. And because of this, you can get a lot of good information now. There are a lot of websites that focus on theme-based trips. There are even travel tour companies that specifically only do these kind of trips, usually for small groups, which I think is the best. You know, when you get too many people in a group, it, 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 
it's not as a quality experience. It starts to dilute the experience, right? Yeah, I think so. And then even there's now bespoke trips. Like, these are trips that company will design for yourself. Say if you want to experience food in Venice, you could go to a particular theme-based tour company that had expertise in in uh, Italy, specifically Venice, and create, uh, say, a uh, eight, nine-day food experience in Venice. And, uh, you know, you could obviously take cooking classes, do a food tour, go outside uh, of Venice to the wine region, which is fabulous, learn all about the cheese making because there's specific different cheeses that were made in that particular area. So you could have a particular trip uh, designed just for you, have a driver and your own guide when you needed it, and you could do it all yourself. You hmm. wouldn't even have to go in a group. So I think that's really good because some people don't like to to travel with groups. You know, I, I know myself because I've done so much travel and I've done so much solo travel. I like to create my own uh, uh, theme-based activities or trips, and, and that works good for me. So, um, you know, if you don't have, you know, all the miles... <laughs> that I do, but you want to do it uh, just yourself, there are companies out there that will help you. Now, there's a specific theme-based travel company that, or website that I think is especially good. It's geared to women. It's called the serendipitytraveler.com, and Peggy Coonley is the uh, creator of it, and she's a very interesting woman. Uh, you should read about her if you go to her website. But she's created this um, whole uh, concept uh, f- which focuses on authentic women travel experiences for discerning travelers. Now, I like that a lot because she wants to give you something that is really uh, based in a culture at some kind of, uh, with some kind of focus that is uh, on a nice level. And her, I find her tours affordable. So it's right in my niche, affordable luxury. And this is affordable luxury enrichment tours, okay? But she does a couple of specific small group tours every year, and she changes the, uh, the tours. Her tours are what I call solo-friendly. Uh, basically, they're for women who travel independently, who want a private room, who want obviously all their logistics covered and there's no extra fees there's that no that's not that single or that uh well the single supplement which is a big downer for a lot of people so she is in the forefront of making it affordable and not penalizing the solo traveler. I think, you know, she she is really, uh, and I love, I love some of the trips that she has done and the, that she's getting ready to do. But I talked about the bespoke trips. She also does bespoke trips. And, and, and on her website, she says it's curated trips around the uh, world for travelers with a specific interest so and she handles all the details and everything i've never taken any one of her trips but you know you can get a feel pretty much from somebody's website and and just the responses um and i would take a chance on her yeah you're you're intrigued oh yeah, yeah 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 and some of her examples of tours just two of them one is historic savannah in charleston i mean i bet she does a fantastic tour there she is from one of those cities i think it's charleston and she does another great chelsea flower show which she takes a small group to london during the chelsea flower show you not only go to all of the events you know a black tie white glove you see all the different types of exhibitions you go to gardens in london i mean I bet that is for people who love flowers and gardening and horticulture. I bet this is just something that is really wonderful to do. So then you have uh, National Geographic, which, you know, 
you really can't fa fault anything National Geographic does except maybe the cost for solo travelers because with National Geographic tours, they have that single supplement. And for some tours, it's higher than the other, but it makes your tour with National Geographic uh, it, it gets it can get very pricey unfortunately but they have great great tours now they do have some private trips that they have started to do and this is along the lines of trying to negate that single supplement and it, it they are more affordable so uh, you know I haven't taken one of their private trips yet but I've looked at the itineraries and the cost, and they seem to be getting more in line with what I think is 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 the right price. So, uh, but some of their trips are smartphone photography course in New York City. They have uh, a Kenyan safari experience, which I bet is fabulous with National Geographic. Culture and cuisine from Orpoto to the Basque Country. I bet that is really great. Human origins, southwest France and northern Spain, and then uh, Provence hiking adventure. So you see, National Geographic, you can find almost any kind of really enriching tour that uh, it is worth doing uh, on their website. So... Uh, and they and they're really getting more and more into this theme based type of tours. So I would highly recommend uh, if you're thinking about one of uh, a theme based tour to look at their website also. I know you have a couple of theme trips. We're going to go into a little bit more detail about what are these theme trips you're highlighting and how do they lend themselves to the solo traveler. Okay, well, I'm going to talk first about a, a trip that I took last fall that I thought was so great. And this was a smartphone photography course in New York City sponsored by National Geographic. And I had wanted to take this course for about a year, especially since I've developed my website and pictures are just so important, the quality of the pictures. And really, when I started blogging, I had no experience with photography. I mean, none. And um, I always kind of had an inferiority complex when it came to trying to do anything like photography or anything visual because I, I can see, but it's I just don't feel like I can put things balanced or right perspective. My husband's an architect. He can take a picture uh, uh, upside down and it looks good. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I saw this course and because I use my smartphone so much now for the pictures that I take because you can get some instantaneous snaps really good, much better than it, if you have to take you know your real nice DLR camera, camera out or I don't know what those initials are. Mine's a Nikon, but it's a great camera. But I thought I'd like to go take this course because, um, you know, I, I know I need help when it comes to my f photos. So uh, I took it, and I tell you, it was fabulous. For starters, it's only two days. Uh, it's very intensive, I have to tell you that. I mean, uh, you start at 9 o'clock in the morning. It is taught by uh, professional National Geographic photographers, and they are the best in the business. They give you, you know, some background basically about them, their philosophies, you know, how uh, they approach photography, etc. You get into lots of information about techniques, color, lighting, filtering, photo apps, uh, you know, uh, composition, portraiture, all this kind of stuff. You are just given all of this information. Then they take you out into the field and they give you assignments that you have to do. And so the, you have three field trips. Then we had to come back and then they critique. You had to pick your five best pictures. They throw them up on a screen. They critique, the teachers critique them, the students critique them, and me, 
I mean, you know, there were people who in the class that had taken five National Geographic photography classes. This is for the amateur, though. I must tell you, this is not, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, they these, especially taken in New York City, I kind of think that there are a lot of, I mean, they had people from around the world there. Wow. And so here me, I mean, I felt like, oh, my God, here I've got myself into something. I'm going to just be the. So they're going to laugh at my pictures. <laughs> no, that's really what I felt like. Well, so I, they threw them up, and, you know, they picked a couple of mine, and they told me what I had done well and what I should do. So, and then, you know, in the end, they put together a little video with music of everybody's photos, and we had a fabulous, nice uh, farewell dinner at Sarah Beth's. Uh, and it it was just a fabulous experience that really did ratchet up my uh, photography skills and I will share with you and it maybe it's a little bragging (laughs) but if you go to their website and you look at um, some of their photos that they have posted by uh, former tour participants Five of mine are on there. Wow. Out of 48. Good job. That's awesome. So so maybe I did learn something. You did. Yeah. Wow. So what I'm saying, that's a great trip if you want to learn about how to take good uh, photographs on your smartphone. National Geographic is the wow. best. And I must I'm say, totally I didn't think this one was particularly super uh, expensive because you could book your own hotel. So, and it was an individual like booking. So it wasn't like couples. It wasn't price per double occupancy. So you could either choose their hotel or uh, another hotel, of which I chose another hotel because I found one that I thought was nicer that was a little less expensive. Okay, then the second example. Uh, is uh, of theme-based trips that also I have something to do with is the art route trips. Now, this is a brand new initiative that uh, was started by the Arts Council of Baton Rouge to create art uh, trips that focus on culture and art around the world. And they came to me to ask me to uh, actually create the trips. So I was, uh, I was thrilled about it because I'm a former music major. I love the arts. I ha- every time I travel, I go to the museums, I go to the concerts. I just do everything when it comes to the arts because I love, well, I love culture. And I love to to just observe all of that and, and uh, feel the energy and the excitement of human expression in different forms. So I was thrilled that they asked me to do it. I One of my favorite cities in the whole world is St. Petersburg, Russia. Russians uh, have a very interesting, multifaceted, exotic culture that uh, I really, I really love. So uh, I've been there three times. I have some very good contacts there. Um, And so I approached them about doing uh, a cultural uh, extravaganza, or we would call it the the best of St. Petersburg tour, the cultural capital of Russia. Uh, And I wanted to have a focus of this particular cultural tour on classical dance, on ballet, because, uh, you know, Russian music is fabulous, Russian literature is moving, Russian architecture is out of this world, but their ballerinas and the level of uh, expertise and the level of their ballet is something that is completely out of this world. I'll never forget my first time going to the Bolshoi uh, Ballet. I was totally mesmerized from everything. So I thought that this would be really nice because I knew that my contacts had a lot of good inroads into the uh, the world of ballet in Russia. So 
and also the art, the executive director of uh, the Baton Rouge Arts Council was a former ballerina, <laughs> so I thought she would really like it. But we, uh, I have put together what I think is just an enchanting trip. It'll be six days. It'll focus on classical dance. We will basically go to a performance uh, almost every night, two ballet performances. One is a folk dance in... Um, uh, dinner at a palace. Another one is a, a Tchaikovsky night mm. that is just a very elegant dinner and it has all kinds of different uh, musical and performing genres that, you know, uh, has Tchaikovsky music, whether it's, you know, opera arias or piano sonatas and they even have pas de deux ballet at this. It's just this, I've, I've been to one of these Tchaikovsky nights uh, at the Cafe Europa, and it is just, it's beautiful. That the, the restaurant itself is just so drop-dead gorgeous. So the whole night with candelabra and everything, it's just, it's really special if you like that kind of thing. You know, so, you know, that'll be part of the trip. Then we'll have a lecturer who will start, you know, somebody who's a professor, he's very well known, knows everything about Russian ballet, the elements, the ballerinas, what makes a good ballet, blah, blah, blah. So we'll get introduced that way. We'll, um, uh, we'll also go to, and I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong, the Vaganova Academy, which that's where uh, the Kirov ballerinas and, mm. and it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a very famous academy. In fact, uh, Renee Chatelaine, the, uh, the former ballerina executive director, said that's the mecca of ballet is the, and I know I'm going to say this wrong, Vaganova Academy. So we're going to go there. We're going to tour behind the Marinsky Theater backstage, see how they make the costumes, the sets, what goes into a production, just the gorgeous theater itself. Um, we'll tour a famous ballerina's mansion. Uh, we're also going to go to a ballet exhibit in the Samalov Theatrical Museum. We're going to have a prima ballerina uh, join us for dinner one night. Then we'll also tour the fabulous Hermitage, the Russian Museum, the Fabergé Museum. We'll go to the Spillblood, Spillblood Cathedral, Yusupov Palace, Catherine's Palace, Peter Hof, all the major, fabulous, out-of-this-world architecture in St. Petersburg. On top of that, we're going to eat in the best restaurants, whether it's fine dining to ethnic food. The restaurants that we're going to eat in, I mean, they are fabulous. So there's no such thing as bad Russian food, because I have eaten fabulous Russian food. And I've gone to a few of these restaurants, but not all of them. So for this fabulous tour, the price is $5,500 for double and $5,650 for single. So I have a very small single supplement, but I couldn't avoid that. So it's just $30 a day, basically more. But I think it's wonderful because it includes food, includes everything except basically your tips, you know, the gifts that you buy, your airfare, and, you know, if you want more than two glasses of wine. So um, I'm really excited about that. So that's, that's going to be my first theme-based trip that I have been involved creating. Well, two things. First of all, regular listeners will know that we actually did a whole episode with Renee, and I'll have a link to that. I think it was episode three or four, but I can't I can't remember exactly the number, so I'll just put a link into the show notes. And then the second thing is exciting is that's this is the first of what you plan to have many of these tours. Oh yeah, uh, and and if this one is successful, we'll do it every year or oh, cool. every other year, depending on because this was kind of rushed put together. And, uh, you know, anytime you do the first thing, it's always a little, you know, uh, it just... It's like the beta testing, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I'm thinking about the music festival in Salzburg next, mm. uh, uh, Austria, next summer. And maybe co combine Salzburg and uh, Vienna and focus on uh, Viennese music composers, 
food, wine, and beautiful. Uh, Austria is beautiful. It's just such a nice place to go to. Um, I'm also thinking about um, Carnival in Venice. I think that, oh, wow. uh, yeah, Venice is one of my favorite cities because, you know, because it doesn't have cars and there's a, so much uh, control when it comes to historic preservation. Everything it's a, it's a such a unique place. It hasn't changed in many ways, and so to experience. Uh, carnival and the meaning of masking and there's so much history history and the reason why people mask themselves and it's just it's just so cool so <laughs> well and I also like that you're going from the Mardi Gras Center in the United States to yeah. the Mardi Gras yeah. Center of Italy that's right yeah that's kind of my thing yeah okay. <laughs> I picked it up yeah <laughs> so but basically these theme based trips are so so good because uh, you know uh, they usually they're small groups they're highly enriching you get a lot of information you know if you pick the right tour they're affordable uh in most everything is included in the trips which is good you got to watch that because they can nickel and dime you if you don't watch that and the, one of the best things is that they're like-minded people that are grouped together. So you have a filter of kind of the consciousness of the other tour uh, participants. Now, you know, there are a lot of different personalities, but when people are interested in the same things, it is really a great bonding tool. And I have personally uh, had uh, uh, developed friendships because of this that are not just you know when you are on trips you'll say oh we'll stay in touch and then you don't ever really but let me tell you you do really on these kind because you there's just something about you know birds of a feather flock together but uh, it, that's a real nice byproduct of this. Are theme trips a situation where the solo traveler should be prepared to pay more than if they were traveling with somebody else? What about if the theme is around a special event? That's certainly sure to add some to the cost. Okay, well, I've kind of touched on this uh, through the whole podcast. Yes and no. If you take a theme-based tour and, and you're with a group, you could pay the single supplement, and that makes it more expensive. If you go at a time of a specific event, say the Cannes or the Cannes Film Festival, I mean, the hotel rooms are going to be oh, forget th it. <laughs> the three times the price, whether you go with a group or you do it yourself and you book your own tickets. But the, the tickets will be super expensive. The, the restaurants you won't be able to get into. I mean, you're going to have to pay three times what you would pay if you, you know, you went at another time. But that's a very special experience. So, you know, uh, it, you will pay for it. So definitely that will be more expensive. If you go to Mardi Gras in New Orleans the last weekend up to uh, Fat Tuesday, that's when things cost the most. And everybody has raised their prices here again. It's more difficult to get great uh, restaurant reservations, etc. It's great to come to Mardi Gras. I mean, everybody who likes to party, you know, they ought to come down here once because uh, it's so unique. You know, but you're going to have to. It will. It's much more expensive than if you would travel here in the summer when it's hot and humid. <laughs> And then, of course, if you go to something like Art Basel in Miami, so they can charge more. What can solo travelers expect from theme trips? First and foremost, enrichment. Because what I've found is with these theme-based trips, the uh, tour guides and the people who are involved in the uh, trip and the presenting all the information to you and the activities, they really work hard to make this uh, memorable for you and enriching. I mean, it's it's not just like your typical sightseeing or whatever. They work hard. I know with in my smart photography course, this very famous photographer Ed Cashy, who is so well known in the photography world, 
He took the time to get to know everybody in the class, have one-on-one conversations with them. And like at the last uh, dinner, um, you know, at Sarah Beth's, he sat across the table from me. And we, we just talked about so many different things. Now, I mean, here is somebody who's really famous. It, but he is so engaged with everybody in the class trying to make sure that they uh, learn something, seeing where they were and everything. It was, I mean, I, I, you know, so typically the people who are involved with these, they really do a good job. So the enrichment factor is great, okay? Second, just like I said, you are traveling with like-minded people, so it makes for a great group because everybody's asking questions. They're you know talking about this, that, and the other, and you just become friends easier. It's it's really nice. Then uh, also you get a deeper, authentic connection to the place and the culture. When you are doing things like say cooking in Sicily, I think that trip would be great. I bet those people come back and they really understand why Sicily is so mysterious and its history and how it's all woven and and uh, how it's got such a, a, a powerful but kind of tragic uh, ethos to it, but uh, still quite uh, beautiful. And so it, you know, so you get that when you're doing these theme-based trips, you're connected more, you understand the psyche and of the place and its culture. Lots of fun. I mean, I, I really, I think these trips just spawn more fun because people are just more engaged in, in everything. And then last of all, just wonderful memories. I mean, the memories, I think, are probably even more vivid when you go on these kinds of trips because you're so immersed in a particular thing so you're more likely to remember them you're more likely also to come back home and take some of the things you've experienced or learned and incorporate them in your life and and that's one of the things that I think uh, uh, is really a byproduct of travel that is fabulous. Dear listeners, you know that the theme of Solo Travel Talk is to get you out there traveling solo. A packing list might help. You can get your own copy of Astrid's complimentary packing list. Just go to astridtravel.com, download the packing list. It's right there on the front page. And in fact, if you listen to the show through Astrid's website, on each of those pages, there's a place you can get the packing list as well. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and really any of the finer places the podcast can be found. Thank you so much for listening. I think Astrid and I are both going to go out and seek out some of the tours. I'm going to go look up every hobby I have and see if there's a tour for it. Well, there probably is. (laughs) There probably is. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. We'll see you next week on Solo Travel Talk. Thank you for listening to Solo Travel Talk. Follow Astrid on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. To learn more about Astrid or Solo Travel Advisors, visit our website, astridtravel.com.